Greetings and welcome back to That Poetry Place. I'm grateful you're here. Today's topic is poetry and the art of ambiguity. Let's dive right in by looking at this picture. What do you think is happening here? It looks like this child is in a motor vehicle of some sort, right? A bus, maybe? How old do you think this child is? Who broke that window? Is this child in trouble? We could keep guessing, but we'll never know for sure, will we? Even so, we can still find meaning here and beauty, perhaps even pity and purpose. Are our everyday lives so different? How often do we have the whole story? Art is ambiguous and so is life. Is there value in acknowledging this? And how does poetry tie in here? I think it's best to start with an elemental question. What is poetry? Some common definitions are composition in verse, a work of literature in which special consideration is given to the expression of feelings and ideas by the use of distinctive style and rhythm, or writing that formulates a concentrated imaginative awareness of experience and language chosen and arranged to create a specific emotional response through meaning, sound, and rhythm. Why write poems? When I've posed this question in the past, responses I have received include because it's a way to honor life, to honor those we love, a way to capture what keeps us up at night, a way to share our stories and life experiences with others. There are various forms and presentations, of course. You've probably all heard of sonnets, haiku, villanelles. Poems think, feel, and assert themselves on the page. The empty page is a tool of the thinking mind, not because it tells you what to think, but because of what it shows you that inspires you to think, often provoking various conflicting emotions all at once. In my opinion, these are the best poems. This beautifully illustrates our topic today, the presence and importance of ambiguity. It shines in literature because it shines in life. Ask yourself, how often are things completely linear and predictable? As human beings, we must develop a tolerance for the gray areas, perhaps even an appreciation for it. I've chosen two poems for us to discuss today, but before we do, I'm going to illustrate a few concepts I believe are essential to good writing, starting with a quote by Anton Chekhov who was a physician who lived in the late 1800s and also an acclaimed author, widely hailed as master of the short story. His quote, Don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. What do you think this means? In a letter to his brother, Chekhov elaborated on this idea, saying, You'll have a moonlit night, if you write that on the mill dam a piece of glass from a broken bottle glittered like a bright little star and that the black shadow of a dog or a wolf rolled past like a ball. In other words, by simply offering a rich description, you can allow the reader to paint his own picture, to draw his own conclusions. And don't discount the importance of the physical arrangement of a poem on the page. Think of it as a painting of words. In that spirit, let's consider these quotes by visual artist Ellsworth Kelly. And these photos were taken at his chapel on the UT campus in Austin, by the way. I'm not interested in edges. I'm interested in the mass and color, the black and white. The edges happen because the forms get as quiet as they can be. I noticed that the large windows between the paintings interested me more than the art exhibited. From then on, painting as I had known it was finished for me. I'm not interested in the texture of a rock, but its shadow. I like silence. I want to paint something I've never seen before. I don't want to make what I'm looking at. I want fragments. 
So now with all of this in mind, let's go ahead and look at some poems, paying special attention to word choice, visual presentation, and how they serve to illuminate the ambiguity of the moments they're describing. This poem is titled First Sunday on the Ward, Pandemic. I wrote it. It reads, Deaf swallows nest inside the thorny crown of a stone Christ. I whisper, Our Father, twice over the scrub sink. Thinking back to Chekhov, how does this poem show what's happening? Well, there's a sense of place and time in the title. An image of birds flocking around a religious statue as well. Also in the last line, we can imagine someone at the scrub sink likely washing his or her hands because that's what one does at a scrub sink, right? Where does one often find scrub sinks and religious statues? In a hospital, right? During the pandemic, it was suggested that hands should be washed for a certain number of seconds. Little directives such as sing happy birthday to yourself were widely circulated in the media, right? This person is reciting the Lord's Prayer twice. In terms of visual presentation, how does this poem paint the picture? Well, there are indented lines and a fair amount of white space forcing the reader to slow down as he or she reads, twice stands alone. Where are the moments of ambiguity in this poem? Number one, Stone Christ. I've had readers ask me whether this paints Christ is a strong, sturdy protector or Christ is rigid and uncaring, perhaps even absent. Thorny crown. Is this a reference to the suffering of Christ and perhaps a foreshadowing of the suffering yet to come in the pandemic? Or does this reinforce the idea of Christ as an uncaring, stern figure? I might also add that we see in this poem that someone is reciting a prayer. But do we know why? Is it simply something in this person's memory that fits the correct time frame, like Happy Birthday or the Pledge of Allegiance? Is this person truly praying? If so, why is he or she saying it twice? Is this an act of pleading, submission, desperation? Does this person even believe in God? And it's interesting that we looked at quotes from Ellsworth Kelly early on. Kelly was an atheist, but he built a chapel. So we can't always assume what someone's intent is by an action. Now, of course, we can't really know any of these things just by reading this poem, can we? I could tell you since I wrote it, but like all poems, this work must stand on its own. I won't always be there to explain it, will I? And I don't want to. I want you, the reader, to draw your own conclusions, to see all the angles, to appreciate the ambiguity. Another poem, In a Station of the Metro, written by Ezra Pound. It reads, The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough. One of my favorite poems of all time. So starting again with Chekhov, how does this poem paint a picture? Well, we see from the title, the setting is a metro station. Ask yourself, where is the narrator in this place? I've found that most readers agree the narrator is probably within the station itself and not on a train, perhaps standing on a platform watching the faces of passengers in the windows as the train zip by, or watching people move hastily within the station itself. One can gather that the movement is fast, given that the faces are described as apparitions, as a blur. Also, Think about those petals. They're beautiful and fragrant, but fleeting, right? And what is a bough? It's a large tree branch. If the branch is wet, the petals might stick to it, even if they've detached from their flowers. But not for long, right? They're destined to fall away eventually. What about the visual presentation? One short sentence divided by a semicolon. And did you notice there are no verbs in this poem? And yet, action is conveyed, masterfully so. 
as is a sense of urgency and impermanence. What are the moments of ambiguity? Where is this station? Who are these people in the crowd? Where are they going? Are they leaving or arriving? What kind of tree for the bow? Is there a tree? What color are the petals? As an ER nurse, I always think of this poem as a metaphor for a busy hospital, and especially during COVID surges. Sometimes it feels like my patients are apparitions. They zip by me as I treat and stabilize them. There are so many of them. It hurts my heart to say it out loud, but sometimes I barely remember their faces because I simply can't keep up. And this applies to staff, too. So many have come and gone, but they become like ghosts as well. Perhaps all of life is like this. As Joseph Conrad said, we live in the flicker. I could go on and on, read you poems all day. But what I would really like for you to do is think about these two poems that we've just looked at. Reread them. Ask yourself those questions. What are the answers? Where do you find the ambiguity? Are you comfortable with it? How do the poems speak to you? I would love to see your responses in the comments, or you can reach out to me directly as well. Again, I thank you all for your time and attention. I hope you found this information valuable, and I hope we'll see you again in future episodes. Thank you.